Let's gather and get seated. As we begin our worship, let me first read the meditation verse from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. We welcome all of you to join us in our worship of the living God today. Before we begin our worship, we just want to remind you the list of uh, responsibilities and ministries that are beginning in the fall and uh, that you might consider praying how you could serve our Lord and God and the congregation in that way would be helpful. And then to get in contact with those ministry directors so that we might be able to serve and honor our Lord in that way. As we come to worship our God, I'll read the call to worship, which is from Revelation chapter 15. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now let us together stand as we sing the songs of praise. We bow down and by faith.
and now by faith. us together in prayer, fix our eyes on the Lord. Heavenly Father, we have gathered this morning to worship you and agree with your word in 2 Corinthians that we will give thanks to you for your indescribable gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And even more, that it includes our total forgiveness, Jesus' righteousness, your unwavering love, your sovereign rule, along with peace now and heaven later. Now enable us by the powerful working of your Holy Spirit within us to heap up our praise and thanksgiving this morning so that we may add to your glory both now and through all eternity. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 1 and we will Read it together responsively. It 
If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. How the faithful city has become a whore, she who was full of justice. Your silver has become dross. Your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. They do not bring justice to the fatherless. Therefore the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. I will turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lie. And I will restore your judges as as the first. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Amen. Let us stand in praise together and ask our mighty king to join us as he's promised as we praise him together. Number 101 in your hymnals. As God's people, he calls us to confession of our sins before him, that he might forgive us through Christ and we might be cleansed. To prepare us for that, I'll read Psalm 24, verses 3 to 5. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Of course, none of us fit that. And the righteous one that comes goes before us and makes a way, even Christ our Lord. So before I pray, let us individually confess our own sin and rebellion to the Lord and 
our desire to be his children who love and follow him. Let us do that now silently. Heavenly Father, forgive our daily acts of rebellion. Subdue our wandering hearts with the love of Jesus, who on the cross has taken upon himself our sin and your wrath. And in return, he has given us his righteousness and your love that we might joyously live as your beloved and forgiven children. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might live for you and your glory instead of our shallow plans and our sinful desires. Amen. We'll continue in our worship as we stand to sing about our hope that is in the Lord, Him read hymnal number 523. My hope is in the Lord. Uh, Well, every once in a while I'm shocked when I worship or prepare for it, and after almost 30 years being ordained in the ministry and singing the Trinity hymnal, I don't think I've ever sung that hymn. And it's such a great summary of the gospel. If you needed to share the gospel with someone, you could easily go there and go verse by verse and talk about how it's not our work, but the wondrous work of our Savior given for us. Praise the Lord. The New Testament scripture reading is from John 7, 
This portion of scripture comes after John 5 and 6, of course. And <laughs> that was where the Sermon of the Mount was. So Jesus has spent quite a while preaching. Now he's leaving there and going to Galilee. John 7, verses 1 to 13. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him, and Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast, for my not time has not yet fully come. And after saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. And the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? There was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he is a good man, and others said, no, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. We have joyous times in the church, and one is when we get to recognize special occasions, and I believe our pastor's coming forth to do that now. going to ask Kara to step forward. She's being very brave to do this. It's not in her nature to stand before crowds. <laughs> but this is an important occasion when we like to uh, recognize your graduation from high school and uh, the mark of this time in your life that you are now looking forward in a new way and uh, as you do, we want to encourage you and present this Bible to remember us by. It reads, presented to Kara Olson with love by your Mount Airy Presbyterian Church family on August 22nd, 2021. Psalm 119, 105, which reads, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light and to my path. Congratulations. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for Kara. We thank you for the blessing that she has been and is to us and ask that you will be, continue to be a great blessing to her, to, to lead her in your way. May your word be a, a lamp unto her feet and a light to her path and show her how she can serve you and live for you and walk with you. We ask your blessing on this uh, day for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You're welcome. Congratulations. Let me now lead you as a congregation as we together give God our thanks and call on him for his help. Let us pray. Our good and gracious God, how we thank you for Kara. And uh, we together would join the pastor and ask you to bless her and her service to you. We also together thank you for the graduation celebration we had yesterday of our sister Grace as she has gone to heaven. 
and the time of a good and gracious news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ was repeatedly proclaimed as well as much thanksgiving for you giving us her as a daughter and a sister, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, great mother, and a sister in Christ. It was a joy to rehearse how she lived for you here and is praising you now. Thank you for the great number of her family who attended and participated as well as the joyous love and service of the Mount Airy family who worshiped you and served and helped us all to give you praise. Lord Jesus, we give you our health concerns of family and friends and trust what you have said, that you will never leave or forsake us in our time of need, even as we fail and find our strength in you weakened. So give us all that we need to continue, and we especially entrust to you Sharon and Tom and Craig, the Laura, Artis, Faye, Faye, Terry's sister Dottie and Rhonda's mother and Dolores. O oh, Holy Spirit, would you strengthen those who serve you throughout the world? Especially Roberta, we thank you for her ministry in Japan with English Bible studies and English language and those who in that ministry have sat under your word. We pray that you would bear fruit in their lives. We pray for her as she returns home for a year on a this ministry assignment as she has opportunity to visit with family, care for their needs and love them and to visit and report to supporting churches. Would you make this year particularly encouraging and strengthening to her, provide for all the needs of ministry? And we would ask for the church in Japan and the team there to continue well in a hard ministry we thank you for the fruit that you have brought. We continue to pray for Kirk and Anna in the Ukraine. We thank you for the great group of American students who were there as interns this summer and the encouragement it was to them in the ministry. And we ask that you would especially bless their ministry to the college students this fall and the preaching of God's word by Kirk as he works through 1 Thessalonians this year, that the church would be encouraged for all that you bring for them. Our God, we place our trust in you as we live in this world that so often seems like it's out of control, and we find ourselves dealing with our own struggles, much less the world. We can become exhausted and concerned about new variants of COVID, being overwhelmed to see the nation of Haiti crushed again with an earthquake, and now before our eyes the terrible turmoil of terror in Afghanistan. Lord God, would you intervene? Would you raise up nation or nations? Would you work by your hand to provide relief? It's beyond us, but not beyond you to move. How we ask that you would. And in all of those places, we especially pray for your church and your people. You know our own tendency to love ourselves and look first to our own family. And we pray especially for our brothers and sisters that even during this time, they would love their neighbors as themselves. That's a supernatural work, which you've done through the ages when the church has found itself under pressure, and you've promised to do it again. May they look to you. May you arrive as you've promised and strengthen and help. What would we do if we were not yours and able to cling 
to the repeated promises in your word that a bruised reed you will not break and a faintly burning wick you will not quench and that you will faithfully, as you say over and over again in your word, bring forth justice. O oh Lord, it's that waiting that is weighing us down. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. The Nicene Creed is longer than the Apostles' Creed. It deals with a few more of the needs of the church, and as we proclaim it together, let's stand as we read it together and confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we proclaimed our faith in our God, who is triune, let us now sing praise to him together. There we go. Now I'm on. Well, today is um, a day to mark in one way, and, and that's to uh, that's to bid our farewell to Jim and Debbie Sagmiller, who are with us for the last Sunday before they move to. South, South Carolina. I always get the South and the North mixed up. South Carolina. And so uh, please stay after a little while um, and, and say, uh, bid, bid your blessings and farewells to them. Uh, we have some refreshments too. So uh, I hope Jim and Debbie have some time to stay as well. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So. But before I begin uh, this morning's message, I also have something else I'd, I'd like to share with you because I'd like to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to look at a list of opportunities that were emailed to you a week or so ago 
uh, in an email entitled, Your Help is Needed. Uh, this list includes ways that you can support the church in its work and worship. And last week, we were considering how we could join with Christ by going with him uh, in the work of his mission and the work of building his church as we live as his disciples, and, and how in this way we can make the most of our time. And I forgot to point this out to you as one of those ways. And so I wanted to take this opportunity today to do so, ways that you can join and serve Christ uh, in his work by uh, supporting ministries um, in our church or supported by our church. And you'll find that list also helpful to pray for those ministries even if you can't serve. But please consider that God might call you to serve in that way. So now I'm ready to uh, move to our message for this morning. Uh, and just to remember that last week, uh, we looked at the subject of discipleship and uh, that passage was, is actually closely related to this week's passage in more ways than one. In last week's text, we read that Jesus saw a great crowd around him. And then he gave orders to go to the other side of the lake. And Jesus was not giving this order to the whole crowd but only to his disciples. And it was clear at the time that it was his intention to leave the crowd and to take his disciples with him. And this action that he took prompted two individuals to talk to him about their following him with the other disciples. And one was a scribe who wanted to join with them, him in becoming one of his disciples. Yet Jesus warned him against becoming one of his disciples because this scribe had a wrong understanding of who he is. And what it would be, uh, what he would be getting into if he became one of his disciples. Because Jesus was not going to build a, a kingdom and a home a palace here on earth, on this earth, because this earth was not his real home. Christ came from heaven. As we read in John, he often said that he was sent into the world by his Father, and his real home was heaven. To follow Jesus as his disciple must, means that you must give up the idea that you will find your real home here on this earth. And in answering this scribe, Jesus went on and, and called himself the Son of Man. This name or title comes from a prophecy in Daniel 7.13, and that title refers to the divine origins of Christ. Now the other individual who approached Jesus was, as he was getting ready to leave, with his disciples was one of his disciples who, who wanted to be excused from following Jesus for a few days. Again, this disciple did not understand fully who Jesus is. Otherwise, he would not have made such a request regardless of the reason, even to go bury his father. Jesus walking on the earth was God visiting the earth. And a disciple would not want to miss this visit even for a moment. This is why Jesus told him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. And Jesus was making some enormous claims about himself, about who he is. He has made other similar claims in his recent Sermon on the Mount. Jesus began his message about the kingdom of heaven by ad addressing those who belong in the kingdom of heaven. And the very first 
thing that he said to them is how blessed they will be to suffer for his sake because they will be suffering for the cause of their king who is the king of heaven. Again, Jesus is claiming to be God, the king of heaven. And as we saw in our previous study, later in Matthew 7, verse 23, Jesus made a similar claim about himself near the end of his sermon when he claimed to be the judge of all men. Now, just before he gets into the boat with his disciples, Jesus answers these two individuals in ways that should have reminded his disciples who he is. They should have understood that God will be in the boat with them. And with this as our introduction, let us read our text. Matthew 8, verses 23 through 27. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there was a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? O oh, you of little faith. And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and sea obey him? Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we, we thank and praise you, our God. All things are in your hands. You rule now over everything that happens on this earth. Nothing takes place apart from your sovereign rule. In your providence, you rule all things that happen to us that come into our lives. Lord, help us to remember and understand that you both govern all things and allow things to occur to us and you love us. And that all things work together for good to those who belong to you and love you. Lord, we ask your blessing now on your word as we come. Open our eyes, open our hearts, Grant us, uh, Lord, a, a, a clearer vision of you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, as we read about this storm that overwhelmed their, their, their boat, we cannot help but be struck by the difference between Jesus, the carpenter, and the disciples, who as fishermen were experts around boats. And Jesus is the one asleep in the boat. So soundly asleep that even the violence of the storm tossing the boat around does not awaken him. The disciples, on the other hand, are wide awake. <laughs> and afraid for their lives. At first, we might, we might want to conclude that Jesus slept because he was really tired and sleepy and, and he fell asleep before the, the storm struck. But when Jesus is awakened and the first thing that he says is, why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? It begins to become apparent why he slept so soundly. He had something that they lacked. He possessed a peace within 
that allowed him to remain asleep despite the noise and violence of the storm. That peace came from the relationship that he had with his Father in heaven. For in John 8, 29, Jesus said, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. The disciples are afraid and desperate, partly because the danger is real. This was not their first storm. And they knew what their boat could handle, and they knew that their boat would not stay afloat if this storm continued much longer. And being in the middle of the lake, with such wind and waves, they knew that they, swimmers though they were, no doubt, would probably drown. So they come to Jesus and, and wake him up and say, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. Now, now, it was a good thing that they came to Jesus. Jesus did not rebuke them for waking him up. <laughs> he rebukes them for their lack of faith because they were so very afraid. They were afraid because they did not think that they could be saved. They came to Jesus in, in desperation, not in the confidence that he could and would save them. Yet their fear, in their fear and terror, they did have enough faith to come to Jesus and ask him to save them. They probably thought that Jesus could pray for them and God would hear his prayer and would make the storm go away gradually, like all storms do, right? They, they had been with Jesus for some time, and yet they still had no, really, no idea who he really is. When we look at what Jesus did first when the disciples came to him, it, it suggests to us that really two dangers were facing the disciples. And the one that presented the greatest threat was not the danger of the storm, but instead the danger present in their lack of faith. The first thing Jesus did was to rebuke them for their lack of faith while the storm was still raging and threatening to sink them at any moment. Then afterwards, he stood up and rebuked the winds in the sea. You will find that in Mark and in Luke, Jesus rebuked the wind in the sea first and, and then afterwards rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. But, but Matthew is very clear about this. And we have to conclude that Jesus repeated his rebuke to his disciples because that rebuke was so important. And repeating it after they were safe from the storm was necessary. Many of them, no doubt, were not listening very well the first time Jesus rebuked them because they were too afraid of the storm to listen. We should not miss, we should not miss this, that how important how important faith is to Christians. To Christians who have already believed in Christ. Faith is so very important in more ways than we realize. Particularly when it comes to resisting the lies of Satan and the temptations of the world and of our flesh. And one indicator that we are lacking the faith that we need is our fears. 
we should not be afraid. The disciples should not have been afraid. They should have realized that really there was nothing to be afraid of, even when facing this threat of death. Why was there nothing to be afraid of? Because Jesus was with them. Time and time again, God tells his people that they do not need to be afraid because he is with them. Moses said to Joshua in Deuteronomy 31.8, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20, King David says to Solomon, Be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, is with you. And in Isaiah 41, verse 10, God says to his people, Fear not, for I am with you. Do, be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is with us, and because of this, we have nothing to fear. Nothing. Not even suffering. Not even death. Because Jesus, through his death on the cross takes our sins away. Just as God promised in Jeremiah 31, verse 34, where he said, For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember, I will remember their sin no more. Now, even death is not to be feared. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which is far better. Because God is with us, there are also other things that we must not fear, such as the opinions or judgments of others, or an uncertain economic future, or the loss of health due to disease. Jesus is with us. Now, this does not mean that we are not to plan for the future or that we are not to take precautions. It means that we are not to be afraid when we have God with us. For the one who created all things with a word can certainly command all things with a word. And so Jesus asked his disciples, since he was with them in the boat, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? It is the peace of Christ and the presence of Christ that delivers us from fears. Hours before his betrayal and death, Jesus said in John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He said that to his 12, or at that time, I guess, 11 disciples were with him who would be facing death for his name. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And after his resurrection, he said to them, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
This promise still applies. We have Christ with us. The reasons the disciples were so afraid is that they lacked faith. They lack, their lack of faith kept them from really knowing Jesus. They did not believe as they should, so they did not know him as they should. They did not know that he could command the winds and the waves, and they would obey him. Many months later, on the night before Jesus died, Philip asked Jesus to show them the Father. And Jesus replied in John 14, verse 9, Have I been with you so long, and you still not, do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? They were with Jesus. They saw his miracles. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him command the wind and the sea. And still, they did not know him. Instead, they marveled and said, what sort of man is this? that even the winds in the sea obey him. They did not know him because they did not believe. They did not know him and because they did not know him, they were so easily overcome by fear. In the end, it was their fear that made them desert him in the garden. It was also fear that made Peter deny him during his trial. Fear can have the same effect on us. Do not let your hearts fear. Believe in Christ and know Christ and you will find your rest in Christ. It has been said that you do not really know a person until you know what they are capable of. What they're capable of doing. And surely it is true that the disciples also did not know Jesus because they did not know what he was capable of doing. They did not know that it was in his heart to take their place and die, die nailed to a cross to bear the punishment for their sins. They had a glimpse of who he really is when they saw the, the wind and the sea obey him, but they did not know him. They did not know his glory as God and they did not know his love for them a love beyond measure a love that brought him to lay down his life that they might be forgiven and that they might belong to him and they might be with him in heaven they did not know the power of his love and the power of his redemption. If they had known, they would not have been afraid. They would have believed in him and would have known that the one who loves them is the one who governs all things. Like they did after his resurrection when they face the Sanhedrin. Knowing is believing, and believing is knowing. To believe in Jesus Christ is to know Jesus Christ, and knowing Jesus Christ is to know that God is love and that God loves you.
amazing as that is for us to believe. Right? But he does. And to know God in this way, to know that he loves you because Jesus died for you, is to know that, uh, and to know that, that he died for you because you believe in him. This knowing Christ transforms your heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the same way, f this faith transforms your heart and your life because this faith brings Christ and his love to your heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the faith that brings the peace of Christ to our hearts and drives away our fears. This is the faith that brings the forgiveness of Christ to our hearts so that we are free to forgive others and ourselves. This is the faith that brings the love of Christ to our hearts so that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to love others with the love of Christ, putting them ahead of ourselves. This is the faith that makes us bold in Christ, to bear witness to Christ in a world that denies him. O oh, you of little faith. Couldn't Jesus be saying that to us? We need, we need a greater faith. We need to know more of Jesus, and we need to know Jesus more. We need to have more of Jesus in, his heart, in our hearts, more of his love and joy and peace. How do we nurture this faith and help this faith to grow from little faith into much faith? Well, we, we begin by, by turning from our sin you know, this is going to sound a little bit like how you came to Christ the first time. <laughs> right. Turning from our sin and seeking God with our hearts. And we can read God's word. Memorize God's word. Meditate on God's word because as God says in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. And we can remind ourselves because we keep forgetting. We can remind ourselves that the things that are seen, this visible light world, it's temporal. It's passing away. While the things that are unseen are eternal. And one day we will leave the temporal and enter into the eternal as we are brought into God's presence to behold him face to face. If there is anyone here who does not believe in Jesus and does not know his forgiveness and, and the joy that comes from being forgiven. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to call on him to save you and to receive him into your heart as your Lord and your God. For he is And to know him is life. And have his life in you is 
all joy and all peace because he is love and he loves you. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and thank you for your word and thank you for this lesson you taught the disciples. Thank you for the the lesson it leaves, it brings to us about fear and trust and peace and how even in circumstances that are truly dangerous, circumstances that truly threaten, circumstances that truly bring suffering, we can have that peace in our soul as we rest in you and your love for us and know that you are always with us to transform every circumstance of our lives because you, our God, are both in control and you love us and we can trust you always. Help our unbelief, help our weak faith to grow. Help us to seek you, to seek your, you in your word and to keep reminding ourselves of the things that you have promised and have said are true. And most of all, that hope and promise we have that we will see you, Lord Jesus, when you come for us. And then we will know you as we are known and we will be like you in every way, almost every way. You remain God. We thank you and praise you. And ask your blessing. Help us to live for you today that we might with joy be received into your presence one day. We pray this in Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Let's join together in, in singing our, our closing hymn. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Let's stand and sing.
is only the beginning. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.